Uh, well, uh, today we're going to talk about essentially the ontology of human civilization uh, and how it, uh, how human society differs from other animal societies. And, and one way to put the question that I'm going to be asking is in the form of a challenge. Uh, about 20 years ago, uh, there was a movement called sociobiology. And the idea was that we ought to study society uh, using the principles of evolutionary uh, biology, that uh, evolutionary biology would be key to understanding sociology and uh, other uh, social sciences. And uh, there was general outrage in the social sciences when this great book was uh, published. Uh, they, they was called the Sociobiology, a new synthesis, a great huge book, and it created quite a stir, and there was general outrage in, in uh, sociology and anthropology. But it struck me at the time that none of these guys regarded it as a theoretical challenge. They ought to take it up. How do, how, clearly we are continuous with the rest of the animal, so-called animal kingdom. Uh, we share consciousness and intentionality with lots of other animals. So what's special about us? And that seems to me uh, that's a, a, a topic worth discussing, and I'm going uh, to discuss it today. My aim today uh, is to talk about how human society differs from other forms of animal societies. And yesterday's lecture was not only intended to give us an account of language, but to provide a foundation for today's work because what we're going to find is that the decisive uh, difference between humans and other animals is that we have uh, a type of language that no other animal, as far as I know, has. And that we, be, we got to the beginnings of that yesterday when I said, well, our language has a built-in deontology. It has a built-in system of obligations, rights, duties, and, uh, and more, most general of all, it has a built-in system of commitments, uh, which really covers the other cases. But I like this technical term, deontic or deontology, because I intend to a very general, a very general application, and I'll say a little bit more about it as we go along. So our aim today is to discuss uh, the nature of specifically human society in ways that human society differs from other animal societies. Now, when I contrast humans and animals, I'm not trying to put those beasts down. I mean, I'm not saying, it's not a plea for human superiority. If it turns out that uh, some of the primates, are, or for that matter, some of the fish have the stuff that I'm talking about, I don't mind. I mean, welcome to the club. Uh, I'm just <laughs> talking about what, what is, a, 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 what you have to have to get members and become a member of the club. Uh, that involves what I'm calling human civilization. And I want to begin by making, um, I want to begin by stating the paradox that I will address. The paradox is this. There are a class of facts in the world that only are the facts they are because we believe that that's what they are. George Bush is president of the United States, and these bits of paper that I carry around in my wallet uh, are, I hope, Swedish money. Uh, and yet, George Bush is president only because we believe or accept that he's president. And this stuff is money only because it is believed to be or accepted or recognized as money. So that's half, half of the of the uh, problematic. But the other half is this. It's completely objective. It isn't just my opinion. Uh, that Bush is president, or that this is a, a Swedish currency. It is an objective matter of fact. <coughs> now, I need a couple of tools in order to get into this, and I've already brought those into the discussion in the first two lectures, but I want to remind you of what they are. First of all, we're going to need, crucially, a distinction between those features of the world that are observer-independent, that exist regardless of what anybody thinks. And those are things like force, mass, gravitational attraction, uh, the solar system, and the fact that hydrogen atoms have one electron. All of that is observer independent. All humans die as we all will. Life fades from the Earth. All the same, hydrogen atoms don't give a damn about us. They will still have one electron. 
But when it comes to money and government and universities and marriage and cocktail parties and presidencies of the United States, all of those are observer relative. And we will be talking today about a subclass of observer relative phenomena. Now, I, 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 won't add, I won't go further with that because I, I, I told you about that distinction in earlier lectures. Uh, furthermore, a second distinction we're going to need is between the epistemic sense of the objective subject of the distinction. Whether or not uh, the truth or falsity of something can be settled as an objective matter of fact, and the ontological sense of the object or subject of distinction, whether the existence of something is uh, dependent on being experienced by a subject, by a conscious subject such as a human or animal agent. I, I see some puzzled faces, so let me remind you what I said. Uh, if you take a statement like, Rembrandt was born in 1606, that is, as they say, epistemically objective. I, I think it's right, but it doesn't matter. We could settle it. I mean, it's just a straight matter of fact when Rembrandt was born. Uh, but uh, I also happen to think that Rembrandt was a better painter than Rubens. Uh, however, that is, as they say, a matter of subjective opinion. I can't imagine anybody holding the opposite opinion, but some people tell me they do, and they even argue. I, so we, here is a case where we have a, a proposition that's epistemically subjective. Now, in addition to that distinction, there is a distinction between the ontological sense of these terms. Uh, objectivity and subjectivity are a big deal in our civilization, and they're very confused notions. So I want you to be clear about, about this much of the notion anyway. And in the ontological sense, something is ontologically subjective if its existence depends on being experienced by a subject. So pains and tickles and itches are ontologically subjective, uh, whereas uh, force, mass, and gravitational attraction are ontologically objective. And you already can see a foreshadowing of the answer to the paradox that I began with, and that is what we're going to find out is that uh, there are a class of institutional facts that are ontologically subjective because they depend on human attitudes for their existence, but they're nonetheless epistemically objective because we can find out about them using objective uh, methods. It's an objective fact, epistemically speaking, that Bush's president or that the piece of paper that I set down here is Swedish currency. Okay, now let's go to work, and I am going to uh, claim, in fact, that though human society has an incredibly complex structure, uh, think of the difference between uh, uh, cocktail parties and wars uh, and universities and presidential elections and tenure and summer vacations uh, and uh, prisons. All of those seem to be enormously varied. Uh, yet I'm going to argue that there's a simple logical structure that underlies the whole complex apparatus. And the analogy with explanations in, the, in other disciplines is uh, obvious. If you think of, for example, of the difference between a rusty shovel and a bonfire, it doesn't look like they have anything in common. But we now know it's the same principle that explains both. It's oxidization. Uh, oxidization is what's happening in the bonfire and is what happens when the shovel rests. And I'm going to try to get something analogous to oxidization in the structure of human society. Okay, and I'm going to claim, in fact, it's a very simple apparatus that you need to do it. Now, in the first part of this talk, I'm going to repeat some stuff that I wrote in a book I call The Construction of Social Reality. But I've benefited uh, from a lot of criticisms that have been made of that book, some by people in this room. Who, there's a sort of, uh, I, I, there's a kind of Berkeley Lund axis in social ontology, and several of the chief, uh, uh, several of the leaders of this uh, conspiracy are here, and I'll call attention to some of the contributions uh, that they have uh, made to this discussion. <coughs> I'm going to claim uh, that it takes a rather simple apparatus to explain institutional reality. And later on, I'll talk, I'm going to first present the original theory, and then I'll state some criticisms of it. So now we get the simple uh, theory, and later we'll go on to the general theory. Well, the first thing we need is the notion of the assignment of function. Uh, humans and some animals, but not all, have the capacity to assign functions to 
objects. They, they give a purpose to an object. And thus they, as we would say, use it for their own purposes. Uh, and strictly speaking, I think the assignment of function, functions are always observer relative. This is disguised from us by the fact that we often discover functions in nature. So in the 17th century, it was discovered that the function of the heart is to pump blood. But remember, when we make that discovery, we make it within a, teleo, uh, within a presupposed teleology. It's only because we take for granted that life and survival are valuable that we can discover the function, that the function of the heart is to pump blood, the function of the vestibular ocular reflex is to stabilize uh, the retinal image. Functions are always observer relative, and the mark of that fact is the notion of a function introduces normative notions which are not present in the notion of causation. If I say the heart causes the function, causes the function of blood, that's different from saying the function of the heart is to pump blood. Because once you introduce the notion of function, you introduce, introduce the notion of malfunction and other normative notions. We can talk about a well-functioning heart, a healthy heart, a, a, a heart that's suffering from heart disease, and so on. But all of that presupposes that you've introduced normativity, and that's a good sign of observer relative. Uh, that all assignments of function are observer relative, and there's a special class of functions that we will be concerned with where they have to do with what an agent can do with the thing. So uh, this has an assigned function. Its function is to keep uh, the time. Uh, this has another set of functions. The Swiss knife has got a whole bunch of functions. But all of those I'm going to call cases like that are cases of agentive functions because unlike saying that the function of the heart is to pump blood, all of those involve an implicit reference to human agents who use the entity in question to perform a certain function. Okay, now a second notion I'm going to need is the notion of collective intentionality. Now we talked a bit about intentionality on a, in the first lecture, and again, I used it yesterday in the second lecture when I talked about how we create meaning by way of intentionally imposing conditions of satisfaction on conditions of satisfaction. But there is a remarkable capacity that humans and lots of other social animals have to act cooperatively, to work in cooperation with each other. They can share a common intention, and indeed, they can even share common beliefs and desires. So in addition to I believe, I intend, uh, I want, there is we believe, we intend, and we want. Now, for empirically minded philosophers, that has always created a puzzle. How can there be such a thing as collective intentionality in addition to individual intentionality? And the general pattern in Western, or in, in sort of in, in uh, so-called analytic philosophy, is to try to reduce collective intentionality to individual intentionality. And the, the typical pattern that that works on is this. If you think of these two guys, uh, they're rather deformed, but anyway. Uh, whenever they have a we intend, it must reduce to I intend plus mutual belief. So it comes out as I intend plus I believe that you believe that I believe and so on indefinitely. So if we're doing something cooperatively, let's say we're, we're both trying to push a car to, uh, to get it started, then I intend to push and I intend to push in the belief that you believe that I intend to push and you believe that I believe that you believe that I believe that and so on. Keep going, okay? It gets, uh, and that's got a name. It's called mutual belief, and it's the same way over here. I intend plus I believe uh, that you believe, etc. That's the standard pattern for dealing with we intentionality or collective intentionality in the analytic tradition. Why? Why do people feel the urge to reduce collective intentionality to individual? And the answer is, uh, they can't 
and to see how you make collective intentionality consistent with our overall ontology. You see, in, a, in, a, in the peer group that I have to belong to, whatever you do, you don't want to sound like a, a, the German philosophical tradition that says there's a kind of Weltgeist, a sort of oversoul floating around on top, a kind of weeness that transcends all of the individual inesses uh, uh, that we have. In other words, there are a very large number, well, not a very large, but there's a sizable number of German philosophers whose names start with H. Uh, and if you don't, if possible, want to sound like Hegel or Haman or Herda or Haida or any number of the other uh, Hs. Uh, okay, now, how do we avoid that? How do we, uh, I think there's a name for this, by the way. It's called methodological individualism. I'm reluctant to use that because it means a whole lot of different things to different people, but that's what this is about. Uh, now, how do we avoid uh, uh, violating the principle of methodological individualism if we're going to say, as I say, that the intentionality is irreducible? It is a basic, primitive, uh, biologically given capacity that human beings and other animals have. How are we going to allow for that if we allow, as we must, that all of my mental life is in my head and all of your mental life is in your head? And there's no oversoul. There's no mental life floating around that's not in the head of individuals. And that's what motivated this urge. The motivated the desire to reduce collective intentionality to individual intentionality plus mutual belief. I, I, I think there's actually a rather simple solution. And the simple solution is to abandon the assumption that because all of my intentionality is in my head, and all of your intentionality is in your head, we, ab we must abandon the assumption that it's supposed to follow that everything must be in the first person singular. Uh, there's no reason why I can't, in my head, have, have simply we intend. And you can't, in your head, have simply we intend. And that seems to me the way we reconcile the irreducibility of collective intentionality with the basic methodological assumption and ontological assumption that all of the mental life that individuals have must be in individuals' heads. So I think it was an imaginary worry that people had for so long that collective intentionality must be reducible to singular I intentionality. Otherwise, you will violate the principle of ontological and methodological individualism. Okay, so now we got two notions. The assignment of functions, particularly agentive functions, and collective intentionality. And I'm going to say collective intentionality as a given. Now, the third notion I need, mean, and that is the notion of a certain type of procedure or rule where we count something as having a certain status. We introduce another vocabulary to describe it. And years and years ago, I introduced a, a terminology of constitutive rule to describe this sort of thing. And the way I explain it, I still think it works, though I'll modify it a little bit later, is this. Some rules function to regulate antecedently existing forms of behavior. In Sweden, uh, the rule now is drive on the right-hand side of the road, right? But I can remember, I guess I'm probably the only person here old enough to remember, when the rule was drive on the left-hand side of the road. But now those rules regulate an activity that exists independently of the rule. You can have driving without those rules. Those are what I call regulative rules. But there are some rules that don't just regulate. These are versus regulative rules that don't just regulate antecedently existing behavior, but they serve to define or constitute the very sort of behavior that they regulate. And the philosopher's favorite example is the rules of chess. It was not the case that a lot of people were pushing bits of wood around on boards, and some genius said, fellas, we got to get some rules, because you keep hanging into my bishop with your knife. And that's not it. Uh, it is that the rules of chess don't just regulate. They're not like pass on the left uh, and drive on the right. They don't just regulate, but they serve to constitute a certain form of behavior. 
And I claim, and we're going to see some interesting applications of this, that typically they take the form X counts and Y, and typically X counts is Y and C. So back to our chess example, such and such a move counts as a legal knight's move. Such and such a position counts as your king being in check. And uh, such and such a form of check counts as check. In each of those cases, you find an X term, and in a certain context, you count it as having, uh, as having, as, as having the Y description. That's going to be important for what follows. OK, now I'm going to make a strong claim. Human social and institutional reality can be accounted by the apparatus that I put on that blackboard. Uh, arbitrarily, I'm going to define a social fact as any fact involving the collective intentionality of two or more human or animal agents. So on that account, I, a, a bunch of uh, uh, animals, say a wolf pack, uh, a, a, a tracking down a deer is a case of collective intentionality as much as the Supreme Court making a decision. Both of those are social facts, and I'll define the class of social facts as, the, as, as any fact involving the collective intentionality of two or more human or animal agents. So when I, I, Gilbert and I, that's my dog, when we go for a walk, that's a social fact because we have collective intentionality. Okay, but now I want to show how using this apparatus you can build up institutional facts. You can build up facts involving money, government, property, marriage, universities, and all the rest of it. Well, okay, I think of a, of a single human animal assigning a function to an object. I, that's easy enough to do. I, I, you can assign the function of being a, a, a seat or a chair to a stump simply by using it to sit on. But furthermore, if you can do that individually, you can certainly do it collectively. So a group of people might assign the function of being a bench to a log, or they might assign the function of being a lever to a big stick that they call opera. But now, I want to show you how you can involve a rather interesting kind of function which is rather special to human beings. And that's this. Imagine uh, that there are a, a group of people I won't call them a tribe or a, I say that they have a village because those are already uh, too theoretical. But let's suppose they're a cluster of huts in which they live. And let's suppose they build a wall around this uh, cluster of huts. And the function of the wall, it's an assigned function, is to keep their own members in and keep intruders out. The wall performs its function in virtue of its physical structure. But now let's suppose that the wall gradually decays until all that's left is a line of stones. But let's also suppose that, watch this vocabulary closely, that the members of the group continue to recognize the line of stones as a boundary in such a way that they recognize that they're not supposed to cross unless authorized to do so, and intruders recognize the line of stones as the boundary, and again, that they're not supposed to cross unless they're invited in or otherwise allowed to cross. Now, I wanted that to sound innocent, but in fact, I think it contains a stunning metaphysical transformation, and it's this. We now have a line of stones that performs the same function that the wall once performed, but it no longer performs it in virtue of its physical structure. It's no longer like a knife, uh, for example, or a watch that performs something in virtue of its physical structure. It performs it in virtue of the fact that there is a collective recognition of the line of stones as having a certain status, the status of a boundary. And with the recognition of that status goes a function that can only be performed in virtue of that collective recognition. I'm going I'm to call those status functions, where you have something that performs a function not in virtue or not solely in virtue of its physical 
but rather in virtue of the fact that the members of the community recognize the object or person in question as having a certain status, and with that status, <coughs> the function that can only be performed in virtue of that collective recognition. And I'm going to say that it's this notion, this fundamental notion, that constitutes the glue that holds human society together. That that is the basic chemical bond uh, that gives us the structure of human institutional reality. Now let me develop that a little bit further uh, by talking about uh, the <coughs> history of money. Money is a beautiful example of this because money is, I mean, uh, a, a currency of this sort is a classic example of a status function. It's money not in virtue of its physical structure. You can't find out that it's money by doing a chemical examination, but you have to look at its situation in society, how it's recognized and accepted and authorized by the governmental authorities and so on. Now, if you look at the history of the development of money in Europe, uh, traditionally the textbooks of economics tell us there are three kinds of money. Uh, there is uh, commodity money, uh, there's contract money, and there's fiat money. But they don't tell us what all those have in common that makes them money and how they actually function. So let's go through it. In the early days, we imagine that people had gold and silver, and they actually, uh, the, um, the value of the coins were exactly equal to the amount of gold or silver contained in the coins. Now, in fact, governments tend to <coughs> would issue coins that didn't have quite that much of gold in it. But in any case, that was the theoretical idea, that something had a function in virtue of its physical structure. It was physically structured in such a way that people value. It had an assigned function, and thus it was observer relative, but it wasn't yet a status function. But now, it's a bit dangerous and awkward to go around carrying gold and silver in your pocket. Uh, so a group of people uh, who sat on benches called banks uh, I would issue you slips of paper on which it said, we'll pay the bearer on demand so much in gold or silver. So we shifted here from having commodity money, the gold and silver, to having paper money, which was in the form of a promise. And some genius figured out that you could, in fact, issue more bits of paper than you actually had gold or silver in the bank and provided not everybody ran to the bank at once to get their gold and, and silver, that paper was as good as gold. It continued to function. And then much later on, some genius discovered you can forget all about the gold and the silver and just have the bits of paper. That's where we are today. Now, in my childhood, a lot of Americans believe uh, that it's only really money because it's backed by all that gold in Fort Knox. It is a meaningless claim because you couldn't actually get the gold for it. There's nearly enough gold in Fort Knox uh, to back more than a tiny amount of the money in circulation. But if this is a case where the belief in the mythology uh, survived the actual logical transformation. And again, in my childhood, American currency always carried a sign, always carried a, a, a sentence that said, the treasury will pay the bearer on demand $20. But if you actually took the damn thing to the treasury and said, I want my $20, they'd give you another $20 bill, that's all. Uh, and later on, very quietly, they, this was never announced, they abandoned that. It doesn't say that anymore on American money. But it still says it on British money. English uh, money still says, the treasurer of the Bank of England will pay the bearer on demand 20 pounds. And then it's signed with his signature. And I've often thought I'd like to go to the guy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is an interesting case. We're going to see more examples of that, where the institution, so to speak, outgrows it, its original uh, justification, and then these residues of the justification survive. Okay, now what I'm going to I'm now going to make a, a strong claim, which I've already foreshadowed, and I'm going to make a claim that how we create institutional reality. We create money. Not just money, but government and property and universities, and we authorize people as doctors and lawyers uh, and licensed drivers by creating a system of status function. 
George Bush is President of the United States because he counts as the President in context C, in a context in which at the election he received a majority of the electoral vote, and that is the constitutive rule under the American Constitution for making somebody President. Satisfying that condition in that uh, a circumstance counts as becoming president of the United States. Now there are several features to notice about this, and that is, and by the way, I'm going to introduce uh, some terminology for this. It isn't just that we have um, a, a state of functions, but the facts involving state of functions I'm going to call institutional facts. So it's an institutional fact as opposed to a brute fact that Bush is president, and uh, it is an institutional fact, as opposed to a brute fact, that this thing is a, a, a 50 kroner. No, it's a brute fact that it's made of cellulose fibers with ink stains. That's a brute fact. But that it is money in Sweden, that is Swedish currency, that's an institutional fact. And I'm gonna make a, an equivalence here. I'm gonna say institutional facts just are coextensive with status functions. I mean, that's what we're talking about. And when we talk about uh, uh, institutional facts are status functions that are assigned by way of collective acceptance. Okay, now three things I want to add to this immediately. First of all, typically, uh, institutional facts require some epistemic index in order that they can function as institutional facts. And I, I have a, a, ner a name for those, I call them status indicators. And status indicators are such things as uh, the badges worn by a policeman. I don't know if the Swedish police wear badges, but American policemen are supposed to wear a badge. They also have a uniform. Wedding rings are status assumptions. Passports, driver's licenses, all of those are cases of, of status indicators, where you have something that indicates a certain status, and generally the, the function of that is epistemic. You need to be able to show uh, that you are in fact married. Uh, you need to be able to show uh, that you are authorized to drive a car in the state of California. Uh, you need to be able to show to the uh, authority of the border uh, that you are uh, a, um, a, a Swedish citizen uh, and you're authorized to travel and thus you have a Swedish passport. All of those are called status indicators. Now, interestingly, sometimes status indicators acquire a kind of life of their own. Um, and this was uh, pointed out by Hernando de Soto, uh, who, who pointed out that, um, uh, in fact, if you have uh, societies where people accept a system of status functions that assigns private property, but they have no title deeds. They don't, they're, they're technically speaking squatters because they don't actually have a, a piece of paper that says that they own this property. Then that weakens the system of private property enormously because they can't go to the bank and get a bank loan and they can't be taxed on the property. So the status indicators, in a way that I didn't see when I first wrote about this, I can can actually function in important ways. That is to say, they can have status functions, even though they are status indicators. Okay, now a second thing, and you won't be surprised to hear this because it was foreshadowed by what I said yesterday. There are no institutional facts and no status indicators without some kind of language or symbolism. Why? Because the X term only counts as the Y term insofar as we represent it as a white. The guy's only president, or married, or a professor in the university. He only has those statuses. He only has those status functions insofar as we represent him as having <coughs> There has to be some way of representing him, and in the broad sense, that has to be symbolic or linguistic. To put it very crudely, there must be some way of representing the Y status function because it, otherwise there's nothing there. You see, there isn't anything more to being president that I then are already contained in the context and in the facts about uh, the particular person. You can't find out that Bush is president by doing a medical exam. 
Uh, you have to do it by looking at his, how he is represented, and that means you must have language in order to do it. Well, you might say, why couldn't you design the object in question so it would be self-identifying? And in some cases, uh, that is so. It, it used to be the case in Britain uh, that, that certain coins had a certain shape so that you could tell, even for uh, people who couldn't read and write, they could tell what the value of the coin was by its shape and size. And I think that's right. But then remember, shape and size are functioning symbolic. They are ways of representing the fact that this is a thruppany bit, or that this is a half crown. Those are types of English coins from my childhood. Uh, so in, it is generally the case, and this is uh, following on from what I said yesterday, that language doesn't just describe institutional reality, it is absolutely essential that it is constituted of it. And it's constituted, it has to be constituted of it, because you see, unlike this thing, which you can see performs its function in virtue of its physical structure, you can tell that you're going to be able to cut with this because of its physical structure. This thing does not perform its function in virtue of its physical structure, it performs its function solely in virtue of the fact that we accept that it has a certain status, and with that status of function that can only be performed in virtue of that collective acceptance. But in order for that to work, there has to be some symbolic means. There has to be a language. And this one, and now I'm now in a position to say what I meant when I said uh, you can have language without money, property, government, marriage, cocktail parties, and universities, but you can't have money, marriage, property, government, uh, what did I hope I say, uh, cocktail parties and universities without language. You have to have uh, language in order to say that. So it isn't just that language is uh, the primary or the most fundamental social institution. It's the one that underlies all the others. It is the one that is presupposed by all the others because language is constituted of the ontology of the institutions in every case. Okay, but it still leaves us with some puzzles, and that is, you might think, well, that's a pretty pathetic apparatus, X counts as B and C. I mean, how is that going to give you the glue uh, that holds society together? And I want to say that it has two interesting logical properties, and those account for much of the, the formal capacity that it has for providing the glue that holds society together. Uh, the first of these is it iterates upward indefinitely. And let me show you how that works. Uh, I open my mouth and these rockets come out. This noise comes out. Okay, that's a brute fact. I make these noise, noises. But these noises count as uttering sentences of English. That's a very simple type of statement. But now uttering certain sentences of English in certain context counts as making a promise. But making certain sorts of promises in certain contexts counts as undertaking a contract. And undertaking a certain <coughs> kind of contract in the state of California counts as getting married. And of course, in the state of California, and I assume in Sweden, once you get married, institutionally speaking, all hell breaks loose. Uh, because now you're entitled to spousal benefits, you got an in extra income tax deduction, uh, you got all kinds of rights and responsibilities that you did not have beforehand. Now, let me show you what's happening in these cases. You have X1 counts as Y1, but now Y1 equals X2, and that counts as Y2, and then Y2 2 equals x3, and so on up. That is, the utterance counts as a sentence, the sentence counts as a speech act, the speech act counts as a promise, and so on uh, upwards. So you get an enormous structure built on this rather simple basis. All right. A second remarkable fact is this, and that is you never just have institutional facts in isolation. There always are elaborate interlocking systems of constitutive structures. So I don't just have money, but I have, and what's this look at? I have money in my bank account at the Bank of America on Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley, California, and it is deposited by my employer, the Regents of the University of California, 
and I use it to pay my state and local and federal income taxes, uh, as well as my credit card debts and my, uh, my utilities bills. Now, every, almost every noun phrase in that, in that sentence that I gave you names a status function. Telegraph Avenue doesn't. I mean, that's just the name of a street. But, but all the other, the Bank of America, and, and, and my employers, all of those names the systems of status functions. So you have this very elaborate interlocking structure uh, that gives you an enormous um, logical power. All right, now, so far so good. I mean, we seem to be um, moving along, and we've I've got I, at least a simple account of the structure of institutional reality, and I'm claiming generality here, so I'm claiming that's how it works. However, there have been some interesting objections to this that I now want to expand on a bit. Um, and some of them, I said, have been made by uh, people in this room, such as Olsa Anderson, who's uh, we, we've had countless discussions uh, with Victoria Holt as well uh, about these issues in Berkeley and in fact also I invented a social ontology discussion group from which I have, I, I have benefited uh, enormously from their tireless efforts to show that I am mistaken in all kinds of ways. And let me tell you some of the uh, things that we have discovered. Okay, how, how are we doing for time? Now, at some point I have to shut up. We're going all right. Oh, okay. Now, so now we go into, this was not a presentation of the, uh, of the special theory, and now I want to expand it so we can get a more a general theory out of it. Well, the first objection is one I don't take all that seriously. It was made by my, my colleague, uh, Bert Dreyfus. And he says uh, that um, if you look at the existential phenomenology of this, you'll see that there's something that is prior to all of this, something that's more fundamental, more basic, more primordial, not a word I use very often. Uh, but anyway, and that is social norms, that people have to have social norms, for example, whereby uh, they stand a certain distance from each other, uh, or they recognize somebody as their leader, uh, and, and he thinks that that is more fundamental than the apparatus that I've been describing. Uh, I don't think so. I think, in fact, the norms that he cites, uh, like the two examples I just gave you, fall into different kinds. They're not the same sort of thing at all. How far apart we stand from each other when we talk is indeed something that varies from society to society. Italians tend to stand closer uh, to you when they talk to you I then do Swedes. Uh, and you often see this at international conferences where the Italian is moving in to try to get close enough to have a conversation. And the Englishman, and they tend to be further apart anyway, the Englishman is <laughs> to get to some respectable distance. And I agree, I think these are interesting uh, social phenomena. Uh, but that's not the same as selecting a leader. If a tribe selects a leader, that is a genuine status function. And indeed, that is something that uh, the form X counts as Y. Such and such a person counts as our leader. We recognize his or her authority, and we recognize uh, that, uh, that that person should be consulted if they have the final say in decision making and so on. So I want to say there are a class of social norms that are indeed institutional facts, and they fit this model. But there are others that are really irrelevant, such as uh, how um, your posture when you walk, or whether you eat with a fork in the right hand or the left hand, or how close you stand to people, those, I think, in general, are not status functions. So I don't take this objection very seriously. But there is another objection I think is very interesting, and I, I think if we appreciate it, it will give us a much deeper understanding of the whole apparatus, and that's this. There are some interesting cases where you don't have to have an X term, where you, so to speak, create a status function out of the blue. A classic case was the invention of the idea of a corporation. And if you think about it, the invention of a limited liability corporation is an astonishing human <coughs> feat. And it's no accident that these are called fictitious persons, because you create an entity out of nothing. 
That is, you don't say this building counts as the General Motors Corporation, or this guy counts as the General Motors Corporation. You just say, in a godlike fashion, let there be the General Motors Corporation, and there is such a corporation. And we all know why people do that, and that is uh, uh, because they can have various kinds of power relations that go with state function without I having the liability that would typically accrue if they just formed an individual partnership. That's why these things are called limited liability corporations. Now, uh, Barry Smith coined the term freestanding Y terms for these entities which can exist without there being any physical object. There need to be a physical object, which is uh, the corporation. Indeed, there isn't a physical object. Right? Under the laws of California for uh, incorporating, you have to have a mailing address, you have to have a board of directors, and various legal powers uh, and duties are assigned to that board, to the members of the board of directors. Uh, and then of course, you, uh, if you issue stock, there are stockholders, and there are various rules and regulations that apply to the issuance uh, of the stock. But there need be no person or physical object who is the corporation. The corporation is, so to speak, created out of the blue. Now, I thought about that, and I think that's right. I think there are cases where you can have the X counts where you have a Y, where you simply create a Y status function without having an X. And the logical form of that, I think, is roughly speaking, let there be, be Y where you don't have to have the Y status function imposed on anything. And then if you think about that, it is actually more pervasive than you might think because it applies even to money. You see, I have been assuming I did assume that money has to have some physical realization. But of course, that's less and less true. All you need to have money is some numerical system whereby you can assign a certain number to individuals or, or corporations or whatever. And then transactions consist in altering the numerical value of such and such an account in favor of the numerical value of such and such another account. You don't have to have any physical realization of money. In fact, the only physical realization that most of our money now has is in the form of magnetic traces in computer on computer disks in banks. But of course, those magnetic traces aren't themselves money. The magnetic traces just represent money. They represent how much money you have in the bank. But the, but that. The money that they represent need have no physical realization at all. There's just the representation. All you need is the representation. Does everybody get this point? It took me a long time to see it, but I think that it's absolutely right that there, there can be cases where you need have no physical entity, which is the money, or which is the corporation, but where uh, you just uh, represent something as existing and the representation is all that's necessary. Now, why? What is going on in these cases? And again, as always in philosophy, uh, we have to allow ourselves to be astounded by what any sane person regards as too obvious to worry about. But what we're, uh, what we're astounded by now is how can there be uh, money and uh, corporations without there being a physical object, which is the money or the corporation? Okay, I think there's an answer that I now want to develop this, and that's this. <laughs> What's the point of doing all this? What's the point? What is what point is served by our inventing and developing and evolving all of these applications of language? And the typical point, and I want to say the general point of this stuff, is that when we create institutional facts, we create facts about money and government, what we do is create a system of power. But not just any kind of power. It's not physical power. It is deontic power in the sense of deontic that I have been using for the past couple of days. That is to say, it's powers that involve rights and duties and obligations and authorizations and permissions and requirements, and again, I say, et cetera. 
Now, I, when I first developed these ideas, I put that by saying that all of these X counts as Ys cash out in systems of collective power. And the power always has, a, has this form. It's we accept that a certain S, a certain person S, has the power that has the power S does A. S performs Act A. So when we make George Bush president, uh, we accept that he has the powers given to him by the Constitution. For example, he has the power to veto legislation. And I thought, and I still think, that in fact, that's a very powerful formula. Because if that's right, that this is the structure of the deontic powers, that we accept that somebody has the power to do something, then it looks like all institutional powers ought to be the result of Boolean operations on that simple logical structure. And in, insofar as I've worked on it, I think that comes out. So if, if I have an obligation, I go outside and I find on my windshield, I hope this doesn't happen in Sweden, but it happens in the United States all too frequently, you find a piece of paper put there by some dreadful person who went by in a little motor scooter kind of thing. And that piece of paper is called a parking ticket. Now you're, you were over parked. And now uh, you have what I call a negative power. <coughs> you have an obligation to pay $25. It's probably gone up. Uh, but anyway, it's a lot of money. So if we accept that it's not the case that S has the power not to pay the $25. Those are standard Boolean operations on this basic underlying <coughs> institutional primitive. Now again, I'm making a strong claim that all institutional rights are status functions, and all status functions are deontic powers, and all deontic powers have this basic primitive logical structure. Now what I assume when I wrote the, the book called The Construction of Social Reality, was that this formula, x counts as y and c, would give us the same result and, as this formula. We accept that S has power, that S does A, because I assume we don't just accept that any arbitrary S has <coughs> power. What we accept is that S has the power because S stands in a certain relation R to Y. Uh, that is, Bush has the power because he is the president of the United States. So uh, one of the relations would be S equals uh, Y, and that's why uh, S has the power. But another case would be, well, you don't, you're not identical with the object on which the status function is performed, but for example, you possess it or own it, and so then you would have generally that would be S, R, Y. So I thought the two formula would be totally equivalent <coughs> because the X counts as Y gives us the status functions, and the power formula gives us the consequence of the status functions, which are crude to human agents in virtue of the fact that they stand in certain relationships to the entity on which the status function was performed. You own the property, for example. You're married to that particular man. Those are cases where you stand in relation to an object on which the status function was performed. You're a citizen of Sweden. All of those are cases where you stand in these relations and the power occurs to you in virtue of those relations. But what we've now discovered is an interesting class. We've discovered a class of cases where this formula still applies, but where there is no X term, but rather you, you create the Y term out of the blue. I mean, that's when you create the corporation or you create money. And in, in so doing, uh, you create a set of power relations without there necessarily being any underlying physical realization of the object of 
Now, why do I think that's so important? Well, the basic point of all of this is to create these power relations in society, is to create these deontic power relations. So we've got institutional facts equals status functions, and that implies deontic powers. Now, I don't want to say that all deontic powers are status functions, but with very <coughs> few exceptions, all status functions are deontic powers. So in a way, the discovery of the freestanding Y term, I think, indeed in increases the power of the theory. Uh, we have to give up on the idea that there's an exact match between X counts as Y, uh, and b between the, the, the count as formula and the power formula, let's call them that. I assume that you got a perfect match, but now it turns out you don't get a perfect match that this one is in fact primary. Why? When you create the corporation, what you create are a set of powers <coughs> that accrue to the stockholders, the president, the secretary, the treasurer, and so on. And that's the cash value. It sounds mysterious to say, well, there's this mysterious entity, the corporation, uh, that has this gassy existence, a spiritual existence. No, nothing of the sort. They're just actual human beings. And some of them are going to <coughs> jail, I know, because, because at Enron they misbehaved in their uh, capacity as the corporation. But it wasn't the corporation uh, I, I, that was committing the crimes. It was these actual individuals who were acting on behalf of the corporation. And in that sense, I want to say is this formula, which is the fundamental formula. The whole purpose of having this apparatus is to enable us to get to that, is to enable us to create deontic powers. Okay, now what's the point of all these deontic powers? We've got this kind of simple apparatus. Institutional facts equal status function, and that implies deontic powers. And I'm going to talk more about this tomorrow, but deontic powers are very peculiar, and they the reason that they function so crucially in human societies is they give you desire-independent reasons for action. And th without that, there is no society. You have to have desire, or I, I don't have room to write it out, but, um, but desire-independent reasons for action. Okay, that's supposed to be an abbreviation. And those are what we live on. I mean, uh, I wake up in the morning in a pretty town in Sweden. I think, gee, it'd be a great day just to go for a long walk in the countryside or maybe try out uh, uh, the uh, system, Bologna, uh, <laughs> all kinds of wonderful things to be done in these pretty Swedish uh, towns. But then, I, as, I, as I wake up slowly, I suddenly remember, oh yeah, I promised these guys that I'd give a talk at 3 o'clock. Now the interesting thing is, it doesn't matter what my inclinations are, how attractive the Swedish countryside is or what the capacity of the system belong at art, I still have to be here at 3.15 and that's what makes society work, is the fact that people have reasons for acting which are independent of their desires or inclinations. And as far as I know, other animals do not have that, or at least I might say they don't suffer from it. Now you take Gilbert, again, my, lab my laboratory of animal behavior. The most I can do with Gilbert is to get him to want to do something. And I can sort of train him to want to do something that he wouldn't otherwise want. But basically, he acts on what he's inclined to do then and there. He never has the thought, well, I'd sure like to do this, but I've got an obligation next week. And if I did this now, I wouldn't be able to fulfill my obligations next week. Our human existence is full of cases like that, the cases where we have desire independent reasons for Okay, so that's the second set of objections that I said were made to the original theory, where we get these um, freestanding Y terms. And in a way, I think that adds to the theory